Good evening, everyone. Get everyone to stand, and we're going to sing Shine, Jesus, Shine. Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Amen. I, I just want to help you out a little bit. I looked on the weather channel. There's a good chance of rain today, okay? So y'all may want to prepare for that. Uh, prepare accordingly, okay? Uh, well, definitely God knows we need it or else we would not have it. So thank God for it. Amen. Um, let's pray. Father God, we invite you into this place tonight, Lord Jesus. I pray to God that you... God would shine upon us tonight, dear Father God, and God, so that, God, come, uh, come tomorrow, God willing, we can be a reflection of that light. So help us, God, not to, uh, not to cover up uh, uh, our Christianity, dear Father God, but help us, God, to unveil, Lord, what you have done in our lives so that we can be a reflection of you, Lord Jesus. God, the world needs to see you, so God, I pray that you would shine through our lives. Dear God, I just thank you for what you will teach us tonight, God. Thank you for uh, just equipping us now, God. And God, I just thank you for how you will bless. God, thank you for, God, just the service this morning, dear God, and allowing us to uh, to honor and pay tribute to our, our military veterans, dear God. And so, God, I just thank you for then. I praise you for tonight, what you will do. And God, I just pray that you, just, you, you alone would receive the glory for it. And we ask this believing because we pray in Jesus' name. If you can agree with that prayer, help me say amen. 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 Please be seated. So welcome to our Wednesday night service. Excuse me, Wednesday. Um, Sunday night service. I'm trying to advance the calendar a little more. But anyways, thank you for choosing to come back tonight. Um, if you're visiting uh, with us tonight for the first time, thank you for choosing to be here. And I'm not always, you know, rattled like this just on days that end in Y, okay? So it gets worse as we go, so just hang in there. 
But anyways, if you are visiting with us tonight for the first time, would you do us the honor of just raising your hand? We'd like to give you a Connect card. Any first-time guests here tonight? All right, so we got a home crowd here tonight. So thank you all for choosing to be here. Uh, just a few things to remind you of this, um, uh, by way of our announcements and upcoming events. And let's see, on the 19th, we're going to have a senior adult luncheon. Actually, a Live Oak Baptist Church in Callahan is hosting this one, so it's going to be at 1030. There is a sign-up sheet back at the information table in the foyer area for that one. Also, there's a sign-up sheet for the prayer breakfast, which we're going to have. This is for our prayer team. They meet, um, uh, well, uh, let's see, quarterly for these meetings. And so we encourage, you know, every person that's on our prayer team, and the people on our prayer team, right now they're praying uh, two people, a uh, pairs uh, uh, um, on Sunday morning, two men, two women, you know, on, on Sunday morning, and uh, they pray through our services. Uh, they've just, it, it's done a, it's been a major impact, I believe, to our, our church services. We've been doing that, I'm not sure how long now, I know for going on a year or, or better, you know, but we could always use more. So if you're, in, uh, if you, uh, if you're um, interested in and uh, becoming a part of that ministry. Hey, come to that breakfast. We invite you to come to that breakfast on the 21st. It's going to be at 8.30 in the morning. By the way, also back out there in the foyer on the, uh, on the main table directly behind the sound booth, there is the Christian Workers Survey Sheets. We need everybody to please turn one in. And, and um, ba basically, if you are a member here, we expect you to uh, do at least one thing. And I don't believe that's asking too much because based upon the scriptures, God, he equips us and he gives believers gifts. So that tells me that we should not just be taking our gift and not using it. So I, mean, I want to encourage you to take, to take one of them Christian worker survey sheets, go through there, and, and try to uh, let God guide you in, in, uh, uh, in the area where he wants you to serve in the ministry here at Black Rock. And somebody pointed out to me this morning that, that there was a uh, there was an area which says wanted to serve, but what it, it was not marked on the sheet. It was not printed on there. And I appreciate them bringing that to my attention. So if uh, if that's the case for you, check the other box and just write it in. You know what you feel God is leading you to do, and you can turn them into our church office, turn it into myself, or if you catch Miss Marita in the hallway, we'll get those turned um, to our um, to our nominate committee. So please have them turned in. Uh, uh, by November the 15th, if you would. Uh, uh, just a, a few other things, and that is the, on the 22nd, we'll have a Sunday School Teachers Banquet. And um, like Miss Janice Hendricks said this morning, you know, she was hoping for ribeye, but you know, since she made those, uh, made those remarks, I'm going to make it bologna sandwiches now. So y'all can thank Miss Janice for uh, changing the menu. I'm just kidding. It's going to be turkey and dressing on that day with some trimmings to go with that. Uh, on the week of Thanksgiving, we will not have a Wednesday night service for the midweek, but we will have the Tuesday night. That gives you know the, our ladies a chance to who like to start cooking that Wednesday, or if you're traveling, give an extra day to hit the roads. So, anyways, let's stand and have a uh, let's take a moment to greet somebody tonight.
as we uh, come back to our seats, let's go ahead and sing, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus the pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us. Great things he hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to sing Trust and Obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus. walk with the Lord in the light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way let us do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other But to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toll he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Good evening, everybody. Just a uh, personal note of thanks for your prayers that have been answered for a lot of people's jobs, including mine, uh, that were people that went back to work. 
I'd just like to thank y'all because I know that there's a lot of prayer warriors here, and prayer is so important. And uh, I thank God for answering that one. You know, he's a good God. I praise his name. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful uh, again for this opportunity to pray to you, to sing to you, to offering, to have offering to you, Father, to, to love you uh, just more and more. We're thankful for everyone here tonight. We pray your blessings of uh, healing and a special touch of encouragement and direction for everyone's life. Uh, and Father, those who are not here tonight, may we remember them in our prayers, Father. And as we give to you, Father, may you bless it in a mighty way. And we see so many results of this, Father, it's evident all around us if we would just uh, be still and know and know that. We love you, we thank you, we, we praise your name, and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Um, I want to be totally honest with you tonight. I don't know what that so um, I don't know what that song was, but I liked it. Okay, I don't know what it was, but it sounded good. It had a good rhythm, a good beat to it. Amen. Please take a copy of God's Word and find the third chapter of the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter number three. I got a feeling somebody's going to tell me exactly what that song was right at when we get done with our service here tonight, and that's okay because it was good. Colossians chapter number three. And when you find your place there, if you can physically stand, please stand with us tonight in honor and reverence to the reading of the Word of God. I want to preach this subject, and this is very near and dear to my heart. And as you know, as we've been studying the book of Colossians through chapter by chapter and verse by verse, so it's not like this was just cherry-picked, and I'm just, you know, trying to preach something that's in my wheelhouse. You know, we're here tonight, you know, for this reason, for this purpose, to, to go through this portion of Scripture and here's my heart. Here's what I, I see across the landscape of America. I see there's an all-out attack on the home. There's a lot of division in homes. There's a lot of, there's a lot of dysfunctional homes. But, you know, uh, it does not have to be that way. There can be harmony in the home. And God's Word gives us the instructions of how to, of how to arrive at that destination. So if you would look with me tonight at Colossians 3, beginning at verse 18, we're preaching on the subject, Harmony in the Home. Harmony in the home. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that, he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Father God, I pray that once again you'd be our teacher. May we be your students, dear God. I pray that you would pour uh, this message into our lives. May he speak deep into our hearts. For Jesus' sake, we pray believing 
And all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. So harmony in the home, Paul, the Apostle Paul who wrote this epistle to the believers at Colossae, he is moving on and beginning a new subject in verse 18. And now I mean, what I mean by that, a new subject, he's leaving the subject which we, la- which we last discussed last week, but what we will see tonight will only make sense when viewed in light of what we looked at last week. And here's what I mean by that. What we look at tonight, Paul addresses all of the fundamental foundation relationships that we have. He speaks to husbands. He speaks to wives. He speaks to children. He speaks to employers. He speaks to employees. So all of these relationships, the only way that they will ever be effective is only when they're carried out in light of verse 16. So look at what the Apostle Paul said. Uh, that we studied this last week. Verse 16, the Apostle Paul said, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So he said, and let the word of God, you know, don't be, he said we should not just be at the poverty level when it comes to our knowledge and to our application of the word of God, but we should, uh, 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 we should, um, uh, be, uh, we should uh, be uh, um, very welcoming to the Word of God and allowing God's Word, God's word to have a, a first place in our life. So let me say it this way. It is only when that when we have Jesus as our number one priority and when we are letting God's Word dwell in us richly that it, that it makes me and equips me to become the husband that God wants me to become. You all right with that? It is only when, uh, when you, ma'am, as a wife, it is only when you are letting the Word of God richly dwell in you and letting the Word of God have its way in your life that you can become the wife and the mother that God wants you to be. It is only when children are under the submission and under the authority of the Word of God that they can become the children that, that, uh, that God wants them to become. And so on and so forth. It carries on into every area of our lives with our employers, you know, uh, uh, being an employee. So we'll see this tonight. Everything is predicated on, uh, on, um, on what we do with the Word of God. So verse 18 through 21, the Apostle Paul, he, he shows us the model of a Christian home. He shows us the model, and he shows us a picture, and, and an instruction manual on how we can have harmony in our home. I mentioned we're under attack. Our homes, our families are, are definitely under attack. And so what we see across our society is that there is a passive, permissive society. Uh, they're allowing any kind of behavior to take place, and they simply are just calling it a freedom of expression. Basically, live like you want to live, do what you want to do, express you want to uh, express what you want to express. You've got the liberty, you have the freedom, you're your own man, so they say. And so under that guise of just uh, accepting and embracing anything and everything under the sun, we have arrived to the place where we are today, where there is divorce on demand, and it just, it's just everything is just so immediately, you know, grown through the court system. But listen, the home is the basic building block of a nation. And as someone says, I don't know who... who who was the original person to quote this, so I wish I did so I can give them credit, but they said this, and I totally agree with this. And here's a statement, as the home goes, so goes the nation. As the home goes, so goes the nation. And if you're wondering why is our nation weaker today than it was decades ago, you know, we can start pointing fingers at the White House and the government, but it, listen, it all begins in the home. And when the homes begin to crumble, guess what? The nation is not too far behind it. So as the homes go, so goes the nation. Paul is writing to the believers at Colossae so that they would experience harmony in the home. He also wrote similar words to the church at Ephesus. So the parallel passage for this passage in Colossians, of course, is Ephesians chapter number 5, where Paul wrote about marriage about, uh, and about the home. So obviously, uh, uh, God, uh, God the Holy Spirit, who inspired the Apostle Paul to write these letters knew that they were under attack then, and consequently God the Holy Spirit knew that the, the family would be under attack today. So, let me say it this way, before we get into the, uh, into the meat of this text, 
You know, when you, you bought an appliance before, right? And a pl- new appliance, especially the newer ones today. They got so many buttons and gadgets, and, and they, come with a, they come with an instruction manual, and they come with a warranty. Now, here's the thing. A lot of time, if we do not follow the instruction manual, it can cause damage to the appliance, and it can also void out the warranty. Marriage is so much more complex than an appliance, but the same things apply. If we do not apply God's instruction manual on how to have harmony in our home and how to live out a Christ-filled life and marriage, if we ignore God's instructions, we will cause damage to our, to our marriage. And we can, and, and listen, when that manufacturer, the person who built that appliance, they know it better than anybody else. So it is great advice to read and heed the instruction manual from the manufacturer. God is our manufacturer. It was, marriage was God's invention. It was his idea. God gave the first bride away to the first husband. God, had, he officiated the first ceremony in the Garden of Eden. And I tell people this all the time. I said, if you had me in a room and Bill Gates in the same room, and you had an issue with your Microsoft program, you probably would not want to come to me. You would want to go see Bill Gates because that was his idea. He invented it. When it comes to marriage, when it comes to the home, look no further than God because God instituted the family way before he instituted government or even the church. So marriage is God's idea, and we need to follow God's instructions on marriage. And when we do that, we'll have harmony in the home. Is it going to be easy? Is anything easy? No, but it's definitely worth, worth working towards. So verse 18, notice the Bible says, what's that first word in verse 18? Wives. What's the first word in verse 19? Husbands. Wow, that kind of, it kind of tells me that God expects us not just to live together, but God wants us to marry one another. Y'all right with that in 2015? God expects, us, God expects us to marry. Uh, Hebrews 13, 4, the Bible says, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And though about this time here, that's when old boy, he steps up and he's so sincere, and he says words such like, well, what's the big deal about a piece of paper? Why do you got to have just a piece, a piece of paper? You know, and they're speaking, you know, I'm talking in the context of marriage and making it legal. You know, this is the person they're just living and cohabitated with somebody. And so they say, well, why do you have just a piece of paper? It's not that important. Oh, really? Uh, when's the last time you bought a car and just walked out without signing any kind of papers? Would you ever want a title for that car? Absolutely. So you sign that paper, right? When, when, when have you ever bought a house and not worried about the papers. Oh, I ain't worried about them papers. You're my friend, right? So when I pay this off, you're going to give me the deed, right? Let's not worry about papers. We ain't got to worry about papers. We wouldn't do that, right? So why is it a big deal for a paper? Listen, because that makes it legal in the eyes of the local authority, but it also brings it in the context that we're not afraid to make a commitment before God and that individual. So verse 18 Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. So contrary to uh, the, the women's lib, the women's liberation movement, the Apostle Paul, he was not the founding member of the hero woman's hater club, okay? He was not, uh, uh, he was not a woman hater, okay? He was not speaking as if women, women are to be inferior to men. But basically we need to understand these are not Paul's personal vows, and principles he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. So what does that tell us then? It tells us that God has ordained it that the man should be the leader of his home. Not as a dictator where everybody else, where the wife and the kids just bow down to him. You know, get, God has called us to be a daddy, not a dictator, so to speak. So uh, God, is, he has ordained that man is to be the leader of his home. And if man, when he abdicates this role, he does so to the peril of himself, his wife, and his children because he steps aside the role that God has ordained for him. And that is never, never safe to, to, to step aside and try to avoid the role that God has placed upon man. Is it easy? No. No, it's not. But like I said, if, if, 
if living for Jesus was easy, everybody would be doing it. But you and I know here on a Sunday night that not everybody is living for Jesus. So you know why you're here? Oh, you, you could have had other things to do. There's 9,000 channels on your, on your cable TV right now. You could have found something else to do tonight, but you're here. Why? You know why? Hopefully you're here uh, for the express purpose of fulfilling verse 16, so you are letting the word of Jesus dwell in you and build a habitation. That's what the word dwell means, is to habitate, to dwell. So you let the word of Jesus dwell in you and habitate and live inside of you so that we can be the husbands and the fathers and the wives and, and the mothers and, 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 the, and the friends that God wants us to be. You know, we, when the choir gets up here, you know, Brother Richard has them he, it's sectioned off where the sopranos are in one section, the altos are in another section, the tenors are in another section. And so when everybody sings their part, guess what? It's a beautiful thing. Is it not right? When everybody does their part, it's a beautiful thing. Now, if you get a, a quartet up here and you got four people and all of them are singing lead, there's not going to be any harmony. But when one person sings lead and the other three can harmonize and sing their parts, then, then there is harmony and it's beautiful. So I say all that to say this. God, he, he wants us to have harmony in our home, but man, we must realize that God has called us to sing the lead part. And when our wives, listen, they are looking for a godly influence. They are wanting somebody to lead them. And when we lead them, uh, undoubtedly, they will follow. And when they sing their parts, and then the children, when they get under the submission of the authority of God, that means they're singing their parts. So when husbands and when the daddy leads like he's supposed to lead, everybody else, when they sing their part, guess what? Then we can have harmony inside the home. But we must realize and recognize what our part is and do the part that God has called us to do. Verse 19, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You notice the instructions to the wife, she is a, uh, her, the instructions to her are addressed to her will, but the instructions to the husband is addressed to his heart. Now, why didn't the Apostle Paul say this? Let's just kind of paint this scenario. Why did he say that husbands, man, you, you better encourage her, support her, cherish her, provide for her, honor her, and be faithful to her? Why did he say all those words? He didn't have to. He said one word. He said one word that encompasses all of those and also surpasses all these things, and that one word is love. He says, husbands, love your wives. I can assure you that when you love your wife like you are supposed to, you will be cherishing her, you will be providing for her, you will be caring for her, you will be protecting her, you will be faithful to her. So he only had to say one word that encompasses and surpasses all these things, and that one word was love. Husbands, love your wives. In the, in the parallel passage that goes along with this, it is Ephesians 5 verse 25, where the Apostle Paul said these words, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Wow, you get that? We are to love our wives like Jesus loved the church and gave himself for her. So guys, if, you, if you've ever said these words, Man, that woman, I tell you, she's killing me, man. That woman's killing me. You're almost there then. You're almost there. Keep on going. Because Jesus said, love her as Jesus loved the church. So you're on the right track. But that's not all he says, these words. And be not bitter against them. And when I got to that point, I get the, I get, I get the whole concept, love your wives. I get that. But he said, and be not bitter against them. It means to exasperate or to irritate them. That same word bitter is also used uh, um, two more times in the New Testament. Both of them are found in Revelation. I will quote one of them. Revelation, verse, uh, excuse me, uh, chapter 8, verse 11. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. The same word there. Be not bitter, you know, uh, against them. So, guys, what, is this, what, the, what the, uh, this uh, passage is saying to us is that we must avoid allowing the kind of bitterness to sour our marriage. 
So what's the, what's the Paul's advice on the positive side of that? Don't be bitter towards them. The positive element would be that we are to cultivate a sweet, loving, tender spirit towards our wives. So I, I thought one time before, because people said this statement, well, you know what, the grass is greener on the side. And what they mean by that, they're ready to jump ship and go somewhere else. If your grass was really, if you seen, listen, if your grass at your house was not as green as you would want it to be, would you sell your house and just move somewhere else? You tell your neighbor, well, we're moving out of the neighborhood. Oh, why? You get another job opportunity? Oh, no, I like the grass in the other subdivision better. Really? You're moving because you're going to greener grass? They would say this, why don't you just fertilize the grass you have and stay where you are? I would say that to anybody that's considering jumping ship. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe there's some flirtation going on there, and there's that temptation and the allurement to, to leave your spouse. I would say this, the grass may look greener on the other side, but it still needs to be cut every now and then as well. So instead of jumping ship, stay faithful to the one God has given to you and just, and, and just, uh, uh, and just water, water your own relationship and fertilize your own relationship and love her like Jesus has called you to love her. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't give up on us? Love her as Jesus loved the church. Back in verse 18, Jesus said these words. He says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. What does it mean? It means it, it just fits. It just it, it, it fits proper. Uh, uh, there was once a sign in the window of a dry cleaning establishment that said these words. If your clothes are not becoming to you, they should be coming to us. So God says much of this, the rest of y'all get on the way home. So God says much of the same thing to us. If our conduct in the home is not becoming, we ought to be coming to Jesus. Verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Um, so children should obey their parents in how many things? All of them. All things. You know, it could be all things in their dating life. In their, uh, in their diet, the things that, you know, things that they eat. And so in their dating, in their diets, in their uh, um, uh, just in, in everything. Uh, I had another D word I was looking for there. Um, in their dress. Oh, yeah, and what they, what they wear. That'll bless you right there, struggling with your children on what to wear. And you try to tell your kids, we tell our kids on Sunday, we want you wearing, we want you wearing pants on Sunday morning. And they say, well, does that say it in the Bible? I, yes, it does say it in the Bible. Okay, Dad, can you please show me, where does it tell me I got to wear pants on Sunday morning? I says it right here. Children, obey your parents in all things. So it says it right there. So children are to, listen, the parental rule is the first circle of authority in God's moral government of this world. The Holy Spirit says in all things. So under the authority of God, parents are to set the standards. We are to define the limits and we, to, and we are to enforce the rules. And listen, let me say this, we cannot, just, we cannot just mandate morality, we must model morality. You know, I just, I hate the idea of the parent just blowing smoke in their kid's face and telling them, now you better not smoke when you get older. It's not enough just to mandate it, it must be modeled before them as well. The greatest example, he the greatest child was, ever, mom, it wasn't me, I'm sorry, it just wasn't me. In, in Luke chapter number 2, remember Jesus was 12 years old. His parents had, had went on. Well, his mom and Joseph went on. Three days later, they finally found him. And he was speaking to the lawyers and the doctors. And, and, and he, said that, he said these words to them. He said, I must be about my father's business. But nevertheless, listen to Luke 2.51. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. The Bible says that Jesus, the Son of God, was subject to his earthly parents. You know what he could have done? He could have said to Mary and Joseph, hey, I'm a son of God. I ain't going back to Nazareth. Hey, Y'all go ahead. Hey, I'm about my father's business. Bye. See you. Wouldn't want to be you. You know? No, but he didn't do that. He was subject unto them, modeling to us that we ought to be in subjection uh, to our parents. So listen, it, 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 I think this is a very true statement. If a child never learns parental authority at home, he or she will grow up to disrespect all authority. Authority in the classroom, the authority from the police officer, and ultimately, and ultimately it progresses. And one day they will reject divine authority and they will learn to say no to God. 
but all begins with the parental authority at home. Verse 21, the Bible says, we're still talking about the harmony of the home here. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So the word provoke means to arouse to anger or to fight. So we are not to discourage our children, but we, we are to encourage our children. And rather simply put, to, to discourage our children is to, is to remove courage from them. But to encourage our children, as the Bible says, uh, for this is, uh, um, fathers provoke our children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So when we do things that demean them, that is, that is disparaging to them, that is, dis, di, that is discouraging, that is removing courage from them. But when we do things as God leads us to do, we are pumping and putting courage back into them. That's how you encourage the discouraged. You put courage back in there. And so when a parent says something along the lines to a child, you're an idiot, you're stupid, what was you thinking? Why'd you do it that, like that? You'll never amount to anything. All of those statements, they're rude and crude, and all they do is they, is they, they remove courage from that child, and they're discouraging. They need to, we as parents need to learn uh, to be under God's authority so that we can model authority, godly authority to our children so that we can put courage back in to our children. So verse 22, Paul now transitions from our domestic life into the business life. In verse 22, he says these words, servants, and we'd say this, we'd use the word employees today. Okay, I get the idea that when Paul wrote this, in the time of Rome, uh, they, they were uh, severely under oppression, and they were indeed slaves. Paul did not take the time to write about slaves here. He later would when addressing the situation between uh, Philemon and Onesimus. But here, he does not take time to get diverted to that. So he says servants, which we'd, we'd say employees. Obey in all things your masters, your employers, according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. So basically, when Paul now gets into our business life, he talks, he, he's talking to us about our work ethic, and we should work the same way when the supervisor is watching us and when he is not watching us. We are to work the same way. We are still to, uh, to produce the same amount of work, whether they're in our presence or whether they are not there. Paul is teaching us that the Christian, the child of God, he should be the best, he or she should be the best worker, the best trustworthy, the most loyal and faithful person in the workforce. And we have, a, we have some motivation for this. What is our motivation? The verse uh, 22, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. We don't do it as men pleasers. You know, we don't do it for, listen, and, and, uh, and it's kind of hard to, to grasp this, but Paul is saying we don't do this to get a good evaluation. We shouldn't do it to get a good raise. Although all those things are benefits of them, we are not doing them for self-gain. Although those are benefits, we want to get good evaluations and get good increases. But he says we are to do it as pleasing God. So that is our main motivation, is that we're doing it to please God. Verse 23, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. And it should be done heartily, he says, passionately. You know, uh, uh, one of the things that I've learned about passion is that you cannot teach passion. Is that right? I, I don't think you can. I might be wrong, but I believe passion is not taught so much as it is caught. I believe you can catch it. I believe you can kind of embrace passion. And, and I believe what Paul is saying here, when it comes to our work ethic, there ought to be some passion behind it. And when we, when we, come, to the, when we come to that job site, and we, we know that our number one priority is to Jesus. And when the boss comes into a group setting, and he, he throws us a curveball and says, you know what, uh, I, know, I, I know I told you you're not going to work this Saturday, but you gotta, you got to work this Saturday. And when the lost world, guess what they do? Oh, man, good night. Man, he, 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 he should have warned us about that. And when Christians chime in and start complaining and moaning and groaning as well, guess what that does to our testimony? It takes it right down the tube. You know, I used to, I, I, I used to not like it, and I've been guilty of this before, uh, of making statements such as, well, that's not my job. I, I don't get paid to do that. How many of you have ever heard somebody say that before? 
How many of you said that before? Don't raise your hand. I just tried to trick you this there. But listen, that is not good Christian moral work ethics. To say, well, I don't get paid to do that. Yes, you do. Oh, uh, uh, um, I didn't get hired to do that. Yes, you did. You got hired to do whatever that manager or that foreman told you to do. And you do it not for him. You do it for Jesus. Not as men pleasers, but as pleasing to the Father. Verse 23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. I just want to, I feel, I feel inclined, and based on what Paul said there, he says that, for you serve the Lord Jesus, you serve the Lord Christ. I just want to serve notice to my church family, you know, because it's, it's, a lot of times I need to be reminded, not only am I, am I a pastor here, I'm also a member of the church, so I want to serve notice to the church that Black Rock Baptist Church, you are not my primary employer. Jesus is my primary employer Black Rock Baptist Church, you just happen to be my secondary employer. Matter of fact, can, does this apply to your life? Absolutely. You know, wherever maybe your, your job was or is, that's not your primary employment. We are all employed by Jesus. He is our boss, and we do what he tells us to do. Verse 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong for which he hath done, and there is no respecter of persons. So listen, uh, shining service will be rewarded, but shoddy service will be punished. Oftentimes, the consequences of our choices remain. Did you get that in verse 25? But he that does wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. You know, if we, if we live our whole Christian life and it is because and it and has in a um, at the end at the conclusion of our life, it's been an embarrassment to the Lord. Our service has been an embarrassment to the Lord. Guess what? Will God forgive you? Absolutely. If God called you to be a a Sunday school teacher and you ducked and you avoided, will God forgive you? Absolutely. If God calls you to be a pastor and you avoided that, will God forgive you? Absolutely. If God called you to be a church janitor and you avoided that call, will God forgive you? Absolutely. Listen, God will forgive us, but listen, don't expect for him to remove the consequences when we stand before God in heaven. I'm not saying he's going to kick you out because you didn't do what he told you to do. What I'm saying is, don't expect to be rewarded for the things that we should have done, but we did not do. God will reward those who faithfully do and, and, and follow through with his service and those that do not do what they should have done. Guess what? Their works, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, will also pass through the fire and everything that's burned up will not be rewarded. It's, there's no respect for persons, the Bible says. Hey, God, if God called you to be a plumber or a preacher, if he called you to work in the factory or the mission field, if God called you to, to, be a, to give your life to science, or to give your life as a sacrifice. It does not matter. What matters is that you do, is that we do what God has called us to do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, just what, um, uh, what you have spoken into our lives tonight. And, it, and it, God, it's my prayer that by your Holy Spirit, God, that you would take these truths and seal them in our heart, dear God. God, I pray that uh, day by day, moment by moment, we would continue just to, uh, to uh, may we continue to decrease so that you might increase in our lives. Because we want to be, God, I, I, I believe all of us have the desire, we want to be the husbands and the wives and the moms and the dads and the grandparents and the friends. We want to be the employers and the employees that make a difference in this world for your glory. But God, no, we cannot do without you. So God, I pray that we would always make place in our heart to, to, uh, to make sure that you are always number one. So God, I just thank you for giving us this desire. And God, I pray that you be glorified uh, through whatever the outcome of this altar call may be tonight. Jesus, may you be pleased. Father, we love you and bless you. In Christ's name I pray, believing. Amen. Now, would you stand with us tonight? And uh, um, I, I don't really foresee... But there again, it's not my invitation, it's God's invitation. I don't foresee a long, drawn-out altar call tonight, but once again, I'm not the boss, I'm just working for Him. Just as you were all employed 
for Jesus. But sir, ma'am, if you're here tonight, you never have received Jesus, you never have responded to his um, offer of salvation, uh, that, means, that means that you are not in the family of God. But you can be. You can be in the household of faith. You can have, listen, tonight you can have a born-again experience by placing your faith in Jesus Christ if you have never done that. Maybe you meant to do it this morning, but you just didn't follow through. God, the Holy Spirit, might have been just, you know, gently as a gentleman knocking on the door of your heart, hoping that you would open and say yes and receive him. But maybe you didn't do it. You're back here tonight. God give you, God has given you another opportunity. Please don't leave the building or don't leave... Uh, 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 don't, uh, don't let uh, your eyes close and sleep tonight, hoping you'll wake up tomorrow, wishing that you can come back next Sunday and make it right with God. Would you do it tonight? Would you do it tonight? If you never had prayed to receive Jesus, you never had prayed a prayer of repentance or placed your faith in Christ, would you do it tonight? Heads bowed and eyes closed. As you bow your head, would you raise your heart to Jesus and, pray, and make this your prayer? Make this yours. You ready? Heavenly Father, I admit I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Dear God, I want to be saved, and and I know only you, Jesus, can save me. So tonight, I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. With your strength and with your power, I will live for you for the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Sir, ma'am, as we sing these hymns of decision tonight, would you be the first to come and, and, and just to share... You know, just by you walking, just by you walking down, would you, you, would, you would share with this church the profession of faith you just made. Maybe there are other decisions, other, other commitments uh, that you need to make tonight. Don't let anything uh, go undone tonight. If God is, is, is here tonight, he's got your attention, and he's wanting to do business with you, do business with God. Don't leave anything undone. Don't wait until tomorrow or Tuesday. God is calling you to be a, a better husband better wife, better father, better mother, whatever it may be. Would you come tonight, ask God to forgive you, ask God to fill you with his spirit, that's important, and give you the strength that you need. As we sing, would you come? Thank you for your kind attention this morning and tonight. I want to remind you if you are participating in the Christmas production that Brother Harold is uh, organizing the Christmas to remember, stay after. They're going to have practice for that tonight. Uh, instead, of, instead of being dismissed with our song tonight, uh, let's, let's, let's be dismissed by prayer because I want you to join with me in praying for the puppet team. Uh, the last we heard before the beginning of the service, they were in Macon. 
uh, Georgia making their way back here in their, uh, and some bad weather. So let's just dismiss by prayer tonight and let's join in prayer for them tonight. Father God, thank you for the events of today. God, I thank you so very much for uh, um, uh, just being here with us, God, this morning and tonight. Father God, we cannot have church without you, Lord. And God, so I thank you for what you've accomplished. And God, our prayer tonight is you just bless Brother Roland as he drives that van tonight. God, just give him alertness, dear Father God, and, and just bless him as they come through this weather. God, keep him safe and bring him here safely. And God, we just trust him, trust uh, him, them into your care. And so we thank you for how you'll bless. May you be glorified. And we just pray this believing because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Lord. We'll see you soon.